Good morning, everybody. Well, we've had a little shower on the mountain. Spring is popping out. The blue bonnets are beginning to pop out on the mountain. Birds are singing. It's a beautiful morning. And I was glad when they said unto me, let us go unto the house of the Lord. I think of that psalm also that says, come and let us go unto the mountain of the Lord. Join with us this morning. We've got a great word for you and a wonderful time of worship and a lot of wonderful help from our dear friends from the Oklahoma City area. God bless you. Sing with us. Don't just watch. Worship with us. God bless you. All right. How many church, how many came with an ex a spirit of expe expectation, believing that God is going to move upon our lives this day? Do you believe it? Are you ready to worship and praise the Lord? Come on. Nations rise and fall. Kingdoms once strong, now shaken. Now trust forever in your name. The name of Jesus. How many believe it? How many trust in the name of Jesus? We trust the name of Jesus. You are the only king forever.
shall reign. Your kingdom shall reign over all the earth. Sing to the ancient Your kingdom shall reign. Your kingdom shall reign over all the earth. We sing to the ancient of days. For none can compare. For none can compare to your matchless word. We sing to the ancient of days.
God, just as your word says that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess, Father, that you are Lord, Lord. Father, we come before you this morning to pour out our offering over you, Lord, our offering of worship to you, Father. And Father, we just pray, Lord, that as we go deeper into worship this morning, that our lives will be changed, touched, and transformed, Father. That we will be more of you and less of us, Lord. Because that is our desire, Father. We worship you this day, Lord. Worthy of every song we could ever sing.
30 seconds and let's just, just the presence of the Lord is really strong in this place right now oh Jesus come on let's just cry out his name for the next 30 seconds come on let's just lift up the name of Jesus Your good 
this is running after, it's running after me. Cause all my life you have been faithful. Cause all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will see of the goodness of God. Let's sing that one more time here in a bit. And right now, I just this is just what I feel in my spirit that says, scripture that says, in all your ways, acknowledge me and I will direct your path. For those of you who might be here, those of the, today or the, even those of you who are watching, you may have something that you just need God to just give clear direction of. Maybe some of you here, you're like, Lord, I just need to hear from you. I need a clear direction. Well, if we begin to acknowledge him, his word says that he will direct us. So this morning, let's sing this song together, but sing it with all your heart and say, Lord, I know what I need today, but right now I'm going to acknowledge you. And I'm going to acknowledge the goodness, the kindness, the generosity, the love that you've given towards me, Father. And Father, with this, I just pray that I know that you're going to direct my path. You've got everything already planned and in order. And I'm going to trust you this morning. I may not know the outcome, but you know the way, Lord. And this morning, let's just, let's just sing this song again. Sam, will you sing this again? Because all my life you have been faithful. Come on and lift up your voice. I've been singing it to the Lord. Sing it to the Lord this morning. Because all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will see.
with that beautiful song Pete Sanchez put to music to exalt the Lord. Jesus said, out of your innermost being will flow rivers of water. That's a call on this congregation to be a clear, unmuddied stream, unpolluted. We're to be a mountain creek, like a stream up in Montana, in Glacier Park, or from the melting glaciers and snow, like a Rocky Mountain stream. And your life is to be that way because that's how God is going to bless you. He wants to clear the muddiness in your life. He wants you to get rid of all bitterness, bad memories, hurt, scars. Probably everybody here has been scarred a few times. But God wants to heal that, and he wants you to be a beautiful stream that flows out of your innermost being. So we'll be talking about that in just a moment. You turn around and just speak to someone and say, you're a, a clear stream. Let's speak it by faith. You're a clear stream. Clear stream. Amen. Come on up here, Gil. Let's make a confession before the Lord, a declaration. And uh, I believe in the word Paul said, give attention to the Word. Listen to this Word, then we'll declare it. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. To Amen. Beautiful. Today's declaration is taken from Ephesians 2, verses 4 through 6, and 2 Corinthians 3, 18. Ephesians 2, 4 through 6. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. 2 Corinthians 3.18, But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. You know, God's ultimate dream for each of us is that we would come into perfect union and communion with him and with his heart. Amen? You know, his ultimate dream is you're in my ultimate peace, ultimate purpose, ultimate love, ultimate fulfillment, amen, ultimate joy. So let's keep that in mind. Let's, let's intention ourselves and say yes to him today as we say this together. In order to satisfy the amazing love with which God loves me, he continually provides a way for me to be brought more in union with himself through Christ Jesus. Although I was once without hope, I am now forever made alive by his great power and love toward me. I continue to be transformed as I fix my gaze upon him and his word. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. Stay up here. We'll be blessing the offering in just a moment, giving you a chance to give. But let's uh, get our music group together. Thank you, worship team. What a beautiful, precious time of worship. And I'm going to let Paul Baskin who has been involved with us in the Tuesday night power meeting, the hour of power through prayer. We've been here soaking in the presence of the Lord on Tuesday night from 7 to 8. We just soak, we meditate, we bless the Lord, and then the last of our hour, we pray over our families, we pray over our health, we pray over the communities, our schools, and our nation. And I just appreciate, Paul, I appreciate you so much. And your dear friends that are with us today, would you uh, introduce them? Sure. And I just thank them for being with us. This is Ken Sarkey and his wife, Kay Lynn. And they have come down from Edmond. Normally a four-hour trip. I think it was five yesterday. They got one of those things on the, the interstate with uh, two different accidents on the way. Uh, they, they weren't involved, thank God. They were just uh, trapped by them, uh, held up a little bit. But we're glad to have them here today. They're very gifted. They, more than anything about Ken, I've known him for, I guess we've known each other about 30 years, something like that, um, early 90s. And uh, he's just, it, it, of, of all the men I know in music, he has got one of the most skilled uh, sets of wanting to bring heaven to earth 
in a, in a way that enters the heart and changes the heart and life. And then he married this woman who has the same gift. So, but you'll see that this morning uh, as they play. Choir, would you come on up while they're shifting around here and getting ready to sing? Come on, choir. Come on up. And out of First Peter. Therefore, rid yourself of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy. Like newborn babies, we crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. Now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. He is good. And so I've written the words to an old Celtic song called The Dawning of the Day. And as you come to him, it says, The living stone rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, we also like living stones are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, an offering a spiritual sacrifice acceptable to God through Jesus Christ for the scripture says he is the cornerstone so here we go with this little Celtic hi choir good to see you Thank you. And I wanted to play a, an original song that has really been on my heart to bring peace in these times. Uh, I wrote it a long time ago, but right now we need God's peace, don't we? And uh, this river of peace that God is made available to us. <clears throat> and so this song is called Make Me an Instrument of Thy Peace. He said he will keep him in perfect peace, those whose mind is stayed on him because they trust him. Make me an instrument
heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Amen. Father, we pray over this offering. We just thank you for the generous hearts with which the finances were given today, and we just ask for your blessing to be upon each one. Father, that you'd increase us first and foremost, Father, spiritually, that the kingdom of God and, and pure love would grow in our hearts for one another and for you. Yes, Lord. But Father, we also pray for financial increase, that we may give more to your kingdom. We thank you, Father, for all you do for us. In Jesus' name, amen. I know that most of us are looking forward to the coming of the Lord. I am. I, tomorrow would be good. <laughs> this song that we're singing this morning is about the coming of the Lord. If you look in the book of Revelation, there's a wonderful picture of what's going to happen to the saints when the Lord comes back. And this is what we're singing about this morning. It's called, These Are They Who Have Come Out of Great Tribulation. They have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb. It's a beautiful song written by Bill and Gloria Gaither, and our soloist is Joshua Torres. These are they.
the strangers and pilgrims will be no longer strangers all the tired and weary wanderers they wander no more the table is spread for the great celebration and the welcome home children to stand. We've got a wonderful bunch of children here. The choir, I want to thank you, and uh, I'd be glad when all of our choir people come back. When we sing those big songs, I miss them. So if you dropped out during COVID, uh, if you're at home watching, come on back. You're safe here. All right. Let's have a word of prayer, and Mary's going to give us a quick report on uh, their triumph uh, in the rally for... Uh, Junior Bible Quiz, Lord, we just thank you for our children. We thank you for all who have worked with our children with diligence and love and teaching. Thank you for Miss Mary and her anointing. And we also thank you for the Junior Bible Quiz participants. In Jesus' name, we just ask a blessing on them as they go out. Amen. Mary, thank you. Tell us what happened. Well, <laughs> short version. Um, we had the beginners and Pee Wee finals yesterday, and um, our beginners were glad to be there. They they didn't have a great showing yesterday, but that's okay. There's our one of our beginner teams is God Generation. Miss Vicky, however, did take first place uh, individual quizzer for the season. So go ahead, stand up, Miss Vicky. All right, what's the next one? And this is this was our Pee Wees. Um, this is our smallest group, and uh, they took second yesterday. They took second, second yesterday, and Joseph was second individual high, and Isaac was sixth. And this is our other beginner team, the elected, and uh, Coach Claude. They had a great time yesterday, and we had nine beginner teams from all over the uh, North Texas district and uh, three Pee Wee teams. And for a year where a lot of areas didn't even quiz, it was good to see everybody together. Our intermediate team will be quizzing on the 27th at the Intermediate and Advanced Finals in Garland. And then we'll start getting ready for next year. Okay, children, stand up and follow Miss Mary out to that special program. All right. Thank you, Mary. Good work. Good work. I'm going to ask you to turn to Ephesians 4. There's a very strong word there. There was a word during praise that God's going to give direction to people here today. And that's what we have is a message of direction. Yesterday, I'm very grateful for the almost 50 men who heard that great challenge yesterday from Charles Logan that God is restoring 
that which the thief has taken, what the canker worm has devoured, and the losses you've suffered. And sometimes we even suffer loss because we shoot ourselves in the foot and uh, make a wrong decision. But the Lord is helping us recover it all. You shall recover it all. That's what the Lord spoke to David uh, to pursue the Philistines who had come and stolen and taken away and captives and all that and wealth. The Lord said to David, you pursue them, you will recover it all. So let's, let's just jump in here for a few minutes. In Ephesians 4, this is a great, great chapter because it's a victorious chapter, and it speaks of the Lord ascending on high. He has ascended on high and led captivity captives, set the captives free, and, uh, and brought them on into the glory land. There's a whole lot of hiddenness and mystery there that we may not all understand until eternity. But when he ascended on high, he did not leave. He didn't create a vacuum and take away the presence of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is that mysterious God that very few people know about. Some churches don't even talk about the Holy Spirit. They don't teach on the gifts of the Holy Spirit. They don't teach of the, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. But I want you to know that God wants the church to be aware of the power and the working of the Holy Spirit. Billy Graham once made a statement, said in a lot of churches in America, you could take away the Holy Spirit and they'd go right on existing. And he said about 90% of them probably would because they've worked without the Holy Spirit. And that's why the church is effete and losing ground and why our nation is divided. We need to get back and let the work of the Holy Spirit convict and convince and bring forth and illuminate the truth of Christ Jesus and illuminate his unending victory and triumph that he won through the cross, through his death, his shed blood, and resurrection. He rose up triumphant over death, hell, and the grave. And it seems like hell is more important and, and doing more business than the Lord. Well, that's just a deception. But the church is going to come awake in revival. A Holy Spirit outpouring is at hand. And I can remember in the Jesus movement that we just, boy, the songs that came out so quick, we didn't have time to get sheet music on them. They were right out of the King James Version of the Bible, and we sang them. We're going to sing one just a minute at the close of my message, one of those Jesus movement songs. If you had a Bible, you could sing it. And we sang off the wall. Then we started putting words on the wall and sing on the wall. But it was a lot of jubilation and, and a lot of rejoicing and victory. God wants the church to be victorious. He wants you to live in victory victory. He wants you to walk in health. He wants you to be blessed and prosperous. He loves you. You're special to him. So let's jump in here. In Ephesians 4, he talks about the victory. Then, uh-oh, then he gets into the things that are the key to victory and the things that will impede that victory. So we're going to start at verse 25 of Ephesians 4. Stop telling lies. Oh, my goodness, we all need to be very honest and ask the Lord to give us honesty. Don't use a lie for any reason. When I started in evangelism, they told me that there's an evangelistic way of speaking, that if you have a crowd of 12, that you could say, boy, well, there was a, at least 100 people there, and they all got blessed. That's called evangelistically speaking. Well, it's not really evangelistically speaking. Uh, stop telling lies. And I'm reading from the New Living Translation. And by the way, I recommend a good study Bible, Life Application Study Bible in the New Living Translation. I've used a lot of wonderful translations. And be aware of this, that the translations come from two different manuscripts. So sometimes they're worded just a little bit different. For instance, here's an instance, and I want to use that as one of my points. The King James was taken from an old, old manuscript, as are the NIV were taken from a different manuscript, the New International Version and the New American Standard, New English Version, all that's from a little bit different manuscript. But in the King James, in New King James, in the seventh chapter of Mark, the Lord has been healing all through the sixth chapter of Mark, 
Great things are happening in northern Galilee. Beautiful, wonderful healings, phenomenal miracles, the feeding of a multitude and teaching the people. And the blind eyes are open. The lame are leaping for joy. Uh, wonderful, miraculous, marvelous things of the kingdom of God are being spoken. And in the midst of this, news gets back to Jerusalem that mass crowds are gathering in places like Capernaum and by the Sea of Galilee. I love Galilee. We've been there many, many times. And it's a beautiful place. So beautiful things are happening. God is bringing good news. There's a new messianic voice going forth in Israel, in northern Galilee. And that word gets back to Jerusalem. So some of these keepers of the law, the Torah, some of these Pharisees hear about it, and they said, well, let's get a group and go up there and assess this thing and see what's going on. So it's a long journey. It's an 80-mile walk. If You don't have buses, and you don't have taxis, and you don't have any other transportation. Probably don't even have good horses. But it's a long walk, so it's several days. And they had plenty of time, these Pharisees, to talk it over what they're going to talk about. And by this time, they ought to have some kind of a burning question. I mean, they've heard of the great things happening, the massing of the crowds, the healing of the blind eyes, etc. And so they finally get there, and they have one big question to ask. And in King James, it says they were critical. It says they, they grumbled what they saw, and they had one big question. Why don't your disciples wash their hands better before they eat? That was their question. And I said, there's a little bit different. Uh, One of the versions doesn't say that they found fault. That's King James. But all versions talk about the fault they found. And so there are a little bit of differences, but get you a good study Bible Don't just read a Bible that has no marginal connections in it. Find out the connections. Because the prophets said they would speak ill of the coming Messiah, and they did. It's amazing when you set out to do something good, the people who will speak ill of it. And they spoke. They found fault. Now, here's where we take up. Paul said, don't do that. And I'm not speaking a word of correction. If you're visiting today, you think, oh, my goodness, what, what is this poor guy doing? All right. Stop telling lies. Let us tell our neighbors the truth, for we all are parts of the same body. And don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry, for anger gives foothold to the devil. I'm back in Ephesians 4, that high-flying chapter of the Lord ascending on high victorious. If you're a thief, quit stealing. Instead, use your hands for good hard work and then give generously to others in need. Don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful. Let me say that again. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be what? An encouragement to those who hear them. And do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit. King James says, grieve not the Holy Spirit. I believe it says it like this, grieve not the Holy Spirit. I love the syntax of King James. New King James says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit's a person who can be grieved. Holy Spirit is not some ethereal ghost that kind of floats around, formless. He is a spirit. He's not like us, but he is the fullness of God. God's spirit, Jesus Christ, and the Father are one in the Trinity. They're distinct persons, and they minister to us in distinct ways, but they all complement each other. In fact, It takes the Holy Spirit to bring us to Jesus, bring us conviction. But when we come to Jesus, 
Jesus said, I want to tell you about my father. And when we come to the father, the father says, behold, my son, in whom I'm well pleased. So they all work together. They're a team. But they're three distinctive personalities, not just aspects. So anyway, the work of the Holy Spirit. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Well, listen, if we grieve the Holy Spirit, you know what the Lord wants to do? He's doing a great restoration. We heard that yesterday in the men's group, and we saw an example of it in the ladies' luncheon when Cookie Rodriguez, this little Puerto Rican waif who had no home life, totally messed up life. She came out of a little city Joy and I visited uh, uh, in Puerto Rico, and uh, came to New York through kinfolk that helped her get to New York, and then all that disappeared. She ended up on the streets, uh, homeless, street person, drugs, and very bright, very bright lady. But someone led her to the Lord. Sometimes the religious people would see her and walk around her, you know, because she, she looked hard and tough and dirty time she didn't bathe for a month. But someone led her to Jesus. Joe and I have worked with David Wilkerson, and she came to found, find a family of believers through David Wilkerson's ministry in uh, Brooklyn over on Clinton Avenue. Gave a tremendous testimony yesterday. She has ministered all over the world, ministered to us. She ministered to me, and she has, ministered, she has a ministry to street people in the inner city. She's paid the price for it. It's a very telling and very dangerous ministry at times. But that's restoration, that's redemption, and that's what God wants to do. He wants to take your life and make something beautiful of it and meaningful and purposeful. But here's what will hinder it. If we grieve the Holy Spirit, because He's at work, making our lives beautiful said, get rid of all bitterness. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. Why? Just as God through Christ has forgiven you, or how that God, how the Father through Jesus, because of Jesus, has forgiven you. Now, there's a very similar word I want to get to. Let me read this in Colossians, because we're going to be singing from Colossians, this same third chapter of Colossians in just a minute. Since God chose you to be the holy people He loves, Verse 12, you must clothe yourselves with tender-hearted mercies, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, and make allowance for each other's faults. And forgive anyone who offends you. Have you ever had the, certainly you have had this experience of wishing you could do over again, maybe something you did, uh, said, um, There are people that once I've learned their situation and what they've come out of, I'm a whole lot more respectful of them and give room for their faults. And if you've ever said something that you were sorry for or laughed at someone maybe who talked funny and then you found out that they genuinely had a speech impediment and you felt so bad, that you'd even laughed or giggled when they talked. You know, we've all had that experience. And this is what he's dealing with. Make allowance for each other's faults. Make allowance for it. Forgive anyone who offends you. That girl on the street corner there in Bronx and in Brooklyn was dirty because she had no home. You could go by and go, ooh, what a dirty girl, you know. And there were religious people who walked by her. She could tell they were religious by their looks. Now, if you look religious, you better be kind. If you pray over your meal, you better tip that waiter and waitress, okay? Amen. Or don't pray over it, okay? Don't give it away that you're a Christian if you're not going to tip them generously. 
Above all, clothe yourself with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony, and let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as members of one body, you're called to live in peace and always be thankful. Always be thankful. So here's what I want to deal with you about. The key to reconciliation, the first and most important one, is forgiveness. I want you to think of all the things that God has forgiven you and given you a second chance on. And that will help you remember how to forgive others. But we've all had experiences in life where we've been blindsided and hurt by somebody else. We've been slandered. We've been opposed with opposing words, oppositional words, betrayed. You know, I've, I've known what it is to be betrayed. And we've all had those experiences. But Joanne and I have lived long enough to let God patiently do his work and not, you know, typically you want to ask God to strike them dead before they get home tonight. But be patient with the Lord. Because he's at work not only to take the bad that happens to you and make good come out of it. He will do that. He has promised that. You can count on Romans 8, 28, for we know. And you need to have an athletic knowing of that, like a coach meeting with his team. Dalton went down to San Antonio Alamo Stadium to watch the Duncanville boys win state. They won state last night and round ball state. Now, they didn't get there by being sloppy. They got there by being corrected, but they got there by being athletic. And you need an athletic. We're in Duncanville schools, by the way. We're in Dallas City. But you need an athletic resolve to say Romans 8, 28. For we know it. Get it into your knower. Get it down deep in you. For we know. Get it out of your head and into your heart. Get it into your heart. So it'll tell your head, we know that all things work together. All things, some things, no, all things work together for good. Not all things are good. But all things will work together for good to them who love God and are called according to his purpose. You have to know that. We've lived long enough to find that out. Find it out is true. It does work. So you can forgive. The main thing is to be forgiving. I want to give you an example of some things I've learned. I've learned a lot from dogs. We've had a lot of show dogs dropped off out here. We call them show dogs because they just show up at the front door. And I've learned a lot of lessons like the bigger the dog, the more the fleas. We had a St. Bernard dropped off here. No collar, no one lost him, no one claimed him, not at the shelter or anywhere. He dropped off here, and we adopted him. Joanne named him Saint because she said, we got to take him home, Robert. We can't turn down a saint. And so we kept him for another 10 years till he passed into dog heaven. Patron saint of dog heaven is more over the dog who licked Lazarus' sores. That's what it says in King James. But, <laughs> but I've learned from dogs. Another thing I've learned when we lived in the country, in the hill country where I used to pastor, our dogs would stay on the front porch. We didn't have fences, but they stay on the front porch. And the difference between a country dog and a city dog, a city dog would be always watching that gate. If that gate comes up, whoo, he's gone. We were taking a walk in our neighborhood last evening to pray over our neighborhood and our neighbors. I'm glad we prayed over your house back there, the I just I thank God for your lovely family up the street there from us. They came in to help us put a flower bed in later, but they've become a part of us. Uh, Rodriguez. But as we walked, we ran into a couple. They were frantic. They were out looking for their lost dog. The gate had been left open, and he was gone. Fortunately, they found him. But that's a city dog. Now, what I want to say, men, 
you be a country dog. You stay on the porch. Even if the gate comes wide open, you don't leave your commitment to that lovely wife God gave you and to that family that God gave you, to the church. Now some of you are old enough to have grandchildren who think you're next to God, so don't disappoint them. Okay? Amen. Boy, I got one good amen out of that. I, I like that. There's old granddad back there. Amen. <laughs> I've learned a lot of lessons. But one of the big lessons I learned was from Lily Dog. She came to us. Somebody dropped out Christmas, had a choke chain around her neck, hadn't been fed. She was ragged and dirty, but she had been lovingly caring for two, three, four little roly-poly puppies. And so when we found some food around here to feed her, they just all scrambled into the food, and she stood back and watched them, and we knew she was starving. Joanne said, I'm going to keep her. We gave the puppies away for Christmas. You laugh, I'll give you a puppy for Christmas, Dalton. <laughs> but we kept Lily, and sure enough, she began to grow back that beautiful fur, and it was beautiful, glistening white fur, as we say in Dallas, what? We can't say white, but what? Our what dog, you know, Lily, beautiful dog. But she had one problem. We'd take her to the hill country with us, and cold of winter, uh, we'd let her come in and lie down by the fireplace, stretch out. But the problem was this. She had enmity against skunks. Now, she could whip a skunk. She could win the fight hands down over a skunk. She was a pretty strong dog, but she'd lose the battle. She'd lose her friends, <laughs> and she couldn't come in before her master and, and enjoy her master's presence around the fireside because, whoo, Oh, Lily, Lily, Lily. She had real enmity against skunks. And more than once, we had to really bathe her and bathe her and bathe her and pour in vinegar and pour in, what was it, tomato juice, tomato juice. I want to tell you, that doesn't help much. <laughs> so what I'm going to tell you is get rid of the skunk. When I was serving when I was at college, in college, I was chosen to be the leader of the youth ministries of our area of eastern Harris County, Houston, and, and Baytown, and Galena Park, and Pasadena, and LaPorte, and Texas City, and places like that. And uh, it was a wonderful gathering of young people, and I was chosen to be their Christ ambassador representative. But someone had started a uh, habit of grading the groups that come in there. They would give out a little handout at the door, and you would get a prize. You'd get a banner if you brought the most people, witnessed the most, and given the most to speed the light and given to ministries. And there was one church congregation, South Houston, would always win it. They were an older congregation. They were big and big, strong, right on the main street drag. And so they were always there, and they'd get the banner and just cheer. The problem was someone had added to that tradition and would give a skunk to the little group that was lowest on the totem pole and in scores. Now, and I noticed that Houston was growing so fast, everyone, they were planting new churches around us, and so small groups would come in from a new church congregation. And I didn't want to embarrass them by giving them a skunk. So I did away with a skunk. You would have thought I'd cursed God. Some of those traditional people who were bound up in the traditions of men that make a null the Word of God. And they criticized me, you know, just even because of the fact that there was no skunk anymore, but the work was growing. We packed out every meeting we had once a month, and the two or three times a year we went to state conferences, and, and I rented Greyhound buses, and we would raise money through uh, Mexican dinners and sales like that and raise money, and everybody get to go. We had a, a choir. One of my buddies was a music major in college on 
on a, on a high scholarship, and he was a good choir leader. And he started a choir, and we would go sing in the conferences. And we had outreaches with the boys. We'd take them camping and spend all night in prayer around the trot lines out on the lake. And a lot of good things were happening. But those people with that skunk problem could not ever quit grumbling because Robert dropped the skunk. And finally, I'd had enough. I was in my uh, college years, and I had become bus driver for the athletic department, and I needed the extra time. I didn't need the worry, and so I finally resigned and turned it over to a friend of mine. George got up and took me up an offering, and I'd never had an offering that good in my life. But those kids responded and poured out their hearts. They gave me their hamburger money, their McDonald's money and all that. And you know what I've been praying about? I had met a beautiful girl that I wanted to marry. And I've been praying about money for rings to propose to her. And that offering bought me those rings. And I was so glad I didn't get bitter over that situation. They can have their skunk, but I don't want it, you know. Get rid of the skunk in your life. That's what the, Paul says. Get rid of all bitterness, all negativism, finding fault. Do trust God enough to be patient to bring good out of bad. Be patient. Joseph was patient. His brothers blindsided him, betrayed him, sold him as a slave into uh, Egypt, and he went by God's grace. He didn't get directly there, but he went from the pit to the palace because that was God's purpose for him. He went to Potiphar's house first as a slave. He went to the prison house as a prisoner because he is falsely accused. But he had a forgiving spirit. And he held on to the purposes of God. He had had a dream and a vision of what God wanted to do with his life. God wants to do something big with your life, something good. He wants to make something good of your life. A cookie, Rodriguez, from a street person who would wrap herself in newspaper and try to stay warm at night to a worldwide evangelist who has spoken in Billy Graham meetings and such as that wonderful woman of God. God wants to do something significant with your life, but he's asking you by the Holy Spirit, you've got to get rid of all bitterness because that will grieve the Holy Spirit. It will grieve his work. And by the way, the Holy Spirit wants to work on that person who offended you, and your bitterness will keep the Holy Spirit from working on them. It'll hinder the Spirit. It'll grieve the Spirit. I don't want the Spirit to go around grieved. He's got enough trouble without my grieving him. And so be quick to forgive and to forget. Now, Brother Robert, that's good preaching, but I know it's easier to talk the talkie than to walk the walkie. That's why you need the Holy Spirit. He'll help you forgive. He'll set it up at times where you can say a pleasant word to that person who's offended you. And if they blow it off, that's their problem. It's not your problem. You know, I've known people that married someone thought would be Mr. Wonderful. He turns out to be Mr. Jerk. But I've known God to make it right in their lives. So hang on. Give God time as Joseph did. He didn't go directly to the palace. He spent time in the pit. He spent time in Potiphar's house, spent time in the prison house. But he woke up one morning as a prisoner. Guess what? Before the day was over, he's in the palace leading the greatest nation under the sun. The bigger the dog, the more the fleas. You got a big vision, a big calling. There are going to be some problems come along with it to prepare you and condition you to be able to handle the big assignment that God has. If you're faithful over a few, he'll make you ruler over that which is much. Be faithful. Be faithful. If you 
hurt somebody with a word, you need to be honest about it and don't say, if I offended you, that puts it back on them. No, you take responsibility. You own it. And say, I'm sorry I offended you. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. I was having a bad day. or You know, you can add something like that. But you be real and you own that thing. That's a problem in America today. No one wants to own the bad attitude. They need to own it because God can't forgive it until you own it. If you always just blame someone else, don't come to God and say, help me, God. You own up, man up to that situation. God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. and This will help you. Forgive others when you know how God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you, how much he's forgiven you. I know sometimes it's hard to forget, and I've had situations in my past life where I've done my best, like when I was the leader of those youth people, and people grumbled and called me and even felt like I'd failed God because I got rid of the skunk. But, but I want you to know that God wants you to go on with your life and not look back. Have you ever noticed that in a car, how much bigger the front windshield is than the rear view mirror? Some people spend their life looking in that rear view mirror. Thank God I've got a backup camera now. I can look in that, you know. That's a lot more helpful. But look forward, look homeward, look toward eternity, and let God worry about the wrongs. We've all remembered the situation here in Dallas. It became national and internationally known when Amber Geyer, the police girl, came to her apartment, she thought. At least that was her explanation. And it was not her apartment. It was Botham John's apartment. He's sitting there watching TV, eating ice cream. And she opens the door and sees him. And according to her testimony, she thought he was a thief in her apartment. She takes out her, her Glock 9 and blows him away. And then she's on trial. And she was convicted and sentenced. Because, you know, a man dies in his own apartment, his own sofa, not any kind of a threat. He's just sitting there watching TV and eating ice cream. There's no way they could just let her go. Well, anyway, you know the rest of the story. When both and John was slain and the trial advanced and she was sentenced, his brother, Brant, his younger brother, Brant, said, let me make a statement here, Judge. I forgive her, and I want her to be able to get it right, and I wish her well. And if you'd let me, I want to go hug her and tell her I love her and I forgive her. That was all over the world. It was broadcast. That's forgiveness. God, give us that big spirit that Brant had, but a bigger spirit is Jesus. While they were beating him to death, he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they are doing. So we've all been hurt. We've been wronged. But here is a season that we're in that God wants to do restoration. He wants to do restoration. He wants to do blessing in our life. He wants us to find our ultimate position, our place, our purpose, our destiny. So don't grieve the Holy Spirit. I put something in the bulletin I want you to pay attention to is that red box at the bottom of the page of the order of service. And I want you to join with me 
and praying forgiveness. And I want you to write by the Holy Spirit's leading. We're going to pray together in just a moment. I want you to write the name of a person that the Holy Spirit quickens to you that you need to forgive. And don't go to them and say, I forgive you for being such a jerk. That's not real forgiveness. <laughs> That's not real forgiveness. Just forgive them. You may not even call them right away. You may not write a letter right away. Give it some time. The Lord may even set up a moment because if he knows that you've got forgiveness in your heart at the right time, he will bring that person either to mind or you run into him in the grocery store or a school or somewhere or a church. And that's what he did with Joseph. Joseph had a forgiving heart. And so when his brothers did come to him in that story, one of the most beautiful lines in all the Bible is in Genesis 50, verse 22, when Joseph said to his brothers, and they're all crying, a time of repentance and weeping, he said, you meant it for evil, which they did. So don't gloss it over. Don't say, oh, it's nothing. Let a person repent. He let them repent. He even set up the, the whole scenario so they could repent. But let them repent. He said, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. That's one of the lessons of our lives, Joanne and I. I wish I could have learned it earlier, but along the way, I've learned it, that no matter what happens to me, God will turn it for good, as long as I'm willing to forgive. And so, don't impede the Holy Spirit's work by refusing to forgive. So, I would like for you to pray with me as, I, as we bow our heads and pray. Lord Jesus, we need to forgive, but it's more than we've got to forgive, we get to forgive. It's a privilege because you have shown us favor and privilege, and you have forgiven us. You have forgiven us. You said you would take away our sins. You would bury them in the sea of your forgetfulness. You don't even remember them. Help our memory to be healed so that we don't remember the slurs, the slander, the lie, the hurt, the rejection, the blind side, the setup, even the betrayal. Because all those things play into Romans 8, 28, that all things, not some things, but all things work together for good to them who love God and are called according to His purpose. Lord, I thank you for that offering those kids gave me that, <laughs> that George took from me. Bless George. Bought Joanne those rings. I've never re <laughs> regretted it. Lord, so in forgiveness, we need to forgive even those that grumbled against us, knowing that God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven me. I can write in a name by the leading of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I'm not going to take this up. <laughs> That's yours. But you pray about it with me and write a name on there. And then all this week, I'm going to ask you, Lord, help me to forgive that person and let me say a prayer blessing on them because I don't know their situation. I don't know what made them grumblers, fault finders. I don't know what made them betray me. I don't know what made them hurt. But there is a rule of psychology. It's rule number one, hurting people hurt others. You can be sure they're hurting. Hurting people hurt others. I taught a group of kids from the inner city of Houston. They were always fighting. I broke up a lot of fights in that classroom. They were hurting kids. They had been hurt. They were street kids. It was a Title I project to try to re-enter them into the educational system mainstream. So I want you to sing a song. We were just commenting from Colossians 3, 
The song says it's from the Jesus movement. So let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. And whatever you do in word or in deed, do it all in the name of the Lord, giving thanks. And if you can't do it in the name of the Lord, don't do it. Would you sing that with me? Colossians 3. So let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. And whatever you do, in word or in deed, do it all in the name of the Lord. Giving thanks, giving thanks to God through Christ. Our Lord, giving thanks, giving thanks to God through Christ our Lord. Now I'm going to pray over you before you leave. God's going to heal some hurt places in your heart. All of us have a soft place. You know, like you go to a doctor and say, doctor, I've been feeling bad. Does it hurt here? No. Does it hurt here? No. Does it hurt? Ooh, it hurts there. He found that hot spot, that sore spot. We all have that. And the devil knows that we've got it. And he's got a busload of people who can come to you every day if that's going to upset you and unsettle you for the rest of the day. He can unload a bus and say, you go get him. You know where his hot spot is. You know how to hit the hot button. We all got that. But as Joy and I were walking yesterday, she had counseled her brother who had gone through a little hurt and convinced him that God was turning around for good, and it has. It's become very good for my brother-in-law, very good. He's at a key place in another city in a ministry. It's worked out good. And I said, you know, Joanne, he just needs to learn like we've learned that uh, God works it out for good. And I said, you know, we're right here on this street in Duncanville because a man probably hurt me deeper than anyone else. He was a leader and uh, an official in my denomination. Caught me by blind side. And it hurt so bad, I finally had to say, Joanne, let's leave this little hollow we live in. Let's leave the hill country. And let's take Kip out of the school. He was a student of the year in Mountain Valley School. And let's move back to Dallas. Like old Jacob said, we got to get back to Bethel. We've got to get back to Bethel. He was hurt so much. He said, I can't stay here. I can't, I can't stay, stand to look at where I was hurt. Let's go back to Bethel. I said, we came back to Dallas. He said, we're walking this street. That man unwittingly did more to help me. And now we had friends who helped us, genuinely helped us like Jim Williams and others helped me get back to Dallas. But that man did more to goad me on to go to Dallas. <laughs> Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. Stand with me, please. We'll pray. Whatever you do, in word or in deed, do it all in the name of the Lord. Giving thanks, giving thanks to God through Christ our Lord. Giving thanks, giving thanks to God through Christ our Lord. If you're struggling over that hurt, I want to pray with you and bless you with a release. There were two key people in my life that prayed with me in my hurts. And that one was Clay Keith, who's ministered here. The other was Harold Bredesen, a Reformed Church man of the Spirit. Both those men have tenderly prayed with me. They didn't make light of my hurt, and I don't make light of your hurt. Someone who should have loved you didn't. Maybe it was a dad, maybe it was a mother, maybe it was a brother, maybe it was a sister, maybe it's someone that you poured your life into 
and somehow it just didn't work. If you'll bow your head, I want you to raise your hand right now. I want to pray for you the grace to let it go, to let it go. All right, hands are up. No one's looking around. Eyes are closed. Lord, I can remember how Cletty wept with me. He said, my God, Robert, don't carry that in your bones. It'll rot your bones. I'll help you get it out of your system. And I became responsible to my brother Cletty and then later to Desmond Evans, my pastor. But I remember the time that Harold Bredesen put his arms around Joanne and me both and cried with us and said, give them the grace to forgive and to go on with their lives. I'm so glad that we did. Oh, God. It was such a release to go on with our lives because you had so much more for us. And the answer didn't come right away. It took some patience and time. And the maneuvering of the Holy Spirit and the work of the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit dealt with those people who had wronged us, hurt us. And the Holy Spirit has a way. I thank you that one came back and said, Pastor, please forgive me. And he made that little swing chair that we still have around here somewhere. People sit in and swing. Made that as a little gift offering for this church. He's going on to glory now. But, Lord, thank you for forgiveness. Thank you that Christ has forgiven us and that the Father, for God's sake, for Christ's sake, has forgiven us. Now give us the conviction of the Holy Spirit that you're at work in this, and you want us to live at peace with one another. You want the whole church world to be at one. You want us to be one people, one holy race. And so, Lord, we forgive each other. We have been too much division between Baptist, Methodist, Church of Christ, Assembly of God, uh, Presbyterian, Independent. Lord, we need to be all one together because we need each other. We certainly need each other. Lord, thank you for the visitor from Dallas Baptist University who came yesterday and met with us in inaugurating our spiritual chapel time and huddle with all the bike riders. And thank you for those 30 riders that came around to inaugurate our Saturday morning chapel little huddle session. Thank you that we've got help from our Baptist friends, our Methodist friends, Church of Christ friends, Presbyterian friends. We got friends, Lord, and I thank God for them. And those who have not understood us, like the man who never came back because I couldn't name Calvin's five points of election. Um, when I'm only a two-point Calvinist, I guess, Lord. But anyway, uh, that's fine for him, but I've, I've gone on. I've learned Calvin's five points since then. But, Lord, we go on with our ministry. We go on with our lives. And let these people go out of here refreshed and a lighter load in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As you go out, I mentioned a man who came in back when we had Straight Street with us. Straight Street was helping originate out of our church, get boys out of prison, helping them go straight with discipleship. They were all here, kind of a rough-looking bunch. But this guy came in, liked the beauty of the hill, and he came up after the service and said, I like it here, but can, can you name the five points of election of Calvinism? I couldn't name those five points. I can name them now, but that's beside the point. Total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and preserving of the saints. Well, that's that. He never came back, but he missed something. And don't you miss it. Go out and praise the Lord. Give thanks, okay? God bless you.